Thanks. Uh, oh. Okay. Well, thanks a lot uh, for the introduction. Uh, it's great to uh, give lectures here at TASI. Um, so as, as Tom was saying, so I'm going to speak about Tensor Networks, uh, I guess for four lectures in total. Um, and well, we're going to do that from a quantum information point of view. So lots of the things that Patrick uh, explained last week will probably come back in one form or another. Um, and so the plan is to spend the first two lectures on tensor network generalities of the basic structure theory, things like MPS, PEPS, and MERA, for those of you who have heard of those. If not, uh, we'll learn what these acronyms mean. And then in the second half of, of these lectures, uh, well, lectures three and four, I want to talk about uh, this idea of building toy models of holography. So um, models that imitate certain features, some features that I, I guess many of you will know or, or learn this the school. Um, so I'll start simple with a simple model, and then we're going to use this idea of tensor networks to build more complicated models. And that's going to be uh, based on the plan for the second half. Um, so yeah, why don't we get started? So I'll maybe just uh, write this down again really quick. You can all see my screen, I guess. That's a question one has to ask in these lectures, even though yes, indeed. <laughs> one hopes, for, you, one hopes yes. for the answer. <laughs> right. and, and I guess I should have said, uh, you can interrupt me at any point. I hope you're able to with the, the mute settings and all that I think you should be. So don't hesitate to do so. I'm just uh, dragging the Zoom windows a little bit so that I can see more people. Okay, great. All right. Yeah, so plan is um, today, um, we're going to learn what tensor networks are and actually we're going to motivate them a little bit. So I'll have an intro to tensor networks, TNs. Um, then tomorrow we'll, well, today we'll already discuss uh, something that's called matrix product state. It's sort of the simplest family of tensor networks, uh, very popular, very well understood. Uh, we'll start discussing those today, but we might continue tomorrow as well. And we'll sort of take that as a starting point to explore other uh, tensor network architectures. One is called a uh, more general, well, it's a very general class called PEPS, PEPS, um, projected entangled pair states, and something called MERA. Uh, which is a 2D network for a uh, 1D system. So that maybe resonates with the title of the talk already, uh, the title of the, of the lecture series already. Um, then as I was saying, we'll start talking about toy models in lecture three, uh, well, a lot of uh, holography in sort of a general sense. And then in the last lecture, we'll have some fun uh, with replicas and we'll learn about the replica trick in tensor networks and in random tensor networks and, and all the kind of things one can compute compute that way. So that's the plan. Okay, so um, before talking about, well, before saying what tensor networks are, maybe I wanna uh, motivate um, the whole discussion a little bit. Um, so roughly speaking, right, a tensor network is like a picture that one draws, there's lots of small tensors, one glues them together, meaning one contracts pairs of indices and one builds a larger tensor this way. And so why do, why do we wanna build tensors? Um, that's because they represent quantum antibody states. So that's the, the motivation, right? So motivation is um, quantum many body states are really the same as tensors, right? We have, we have a, a wave function or a vector in Hilbert space, right? Of certain dimensions, say we have capital N many constituents. Let's assume everything's finite dimensional. Nothing is complicated technically. Uh, just with n tensor factors and n particles or n sites, uh, right? Then we can think of this. Uh, we can think of the coefficients as defining well the components of a tensor, um, and so we'll all the time draw pictures like this one, right? Where so the first index corresponds to the first uh, tensor factor here, the second one to the second, and so on. So there's capital n many legs. It's the i nth one here. Okay. Now, of course, generically. Um, to describe um, such a tensor, right? Let's assume maybe for simplicity that all these dimensions are the same. I think we're maybe going to do this today. So there's n sites, right? Each has dimension d. Um, uh, then this many body state will be described by d to the n parameters, right? An exponential number of parameters in the number of particles or in the system size. If you think of this as, for example, as n spins on a lattice or something like this. So we have um, so a generic state require d to the n many parameters, okay. Oops. Okay. Um, so that's of course the reason why, why quantum mechanics is, is tricky. I, I guess the same is true for probability theory, but 
Okay. Uh, but we think of this as one reason why quantum mechanics is tricky, right? It's even harder or difficult or um, a problem writing down the wave function in this way. Um, but then on the other hand, of course, many aspects of physics are local, quasi local. Um, and that implies, as we'll discuss sort of very heuristically in a moment, um, that the states that we care about often, that the states that we care about often are very special. So we are not interested in describing generic states typically. Uh, maybe we are interested in, in computing with them for you know, toy models and or whatnot, but generically we are not interested in describing it. Okay. So because uh, uh, there's this idea of locality and all very heuristic, heuristically right physics is local, um, uh, many states of interests, I'll be more precise in a moment, um, are special. And they're special in a way that um, we can show or we believe that they admit a more succinct description, a more compact description, but also a description that's more insightful than just writing down all the components of the wave function. Okay. So a picture that I think uh, has to be in any uh, talk or lecture about tensor network is the picture of an exponentially large Hilbert space, which is the circle. And then in the Hilbert space, there's a little corner and right in that's a set of uh, physically relevant states. And really, uh, I mean, this is of course not to scale, right? But uh, uh, really we would be interested in finding interesting um, uh, parameterizations of, of this little corner, the sort of the physically relevant corner of Hilbert space, um, whatever that means at this point. Uh, okay. So what would such states be that we care about? So, so states that we'll, we'll talk about would be uh, say ground states or low energy states of local Hamiltonians, right? So that's one way in which locality enters is that you know, many systems are described by local Hamiltonians and actions are local. Um, and uh, such states are very special uh, in, for example, as uh, with regards to their correlations or with regards to the entanglement properties. Okay, so one class of examples would be low energy states of local Hamiltonians. Um, or so local Hamiltonian, right, would be a term Hamiltonian that I can write as a sum of terms HK and each H sub K only acts on some, say, uh, bounded region, say on some lattice. Uh, other examples uh, would be, um, uh, say, vacuum states uh, in, 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 in quantum field theory. Those are maybe a bit more tricky, right? Because at least in my uh, cartoon today, and actually in all my lectures, I, I, I think I'll be talking about finite dimensional um, Hilbert spaces, tensor products and so on. Of course, to go from here to there, uh, one has to truncate, regularize, but not, um, which, which we won't do. But on this level, the part of the discussion, that, that will not be an issue, I, I think. Okay, uh, very good. Now, um, what, what makes these states special? So I, I want to, Talk about two aspects, right? One is the, what concerns their correlations, correlations in those states, the correlation functions, uh, and the other is entanglement properties. Um, so let's first discuss correlations. Uh, sort of one generic phenomenon that one observes is that in many um, uh, uh, well, physical models or many ground states uh, of local Hamiltonians, one finds that correlations decay and they often decay exponentially, right? That's when there's an energy gap in the Hamiltonian. So there's a gap between the, the, the ground state energy and the next excited state. Or maybe in a critical or gapless theory, they do not decay exponentially, but rather only polynomial, right? But at least they generically decay, okay? Up to, yeah, so say, so that's maybe an expectation. So the two things I'm going to write down now, they are sort of heuristics, the expectations, they will motivate um, the formalism will develop in a moment. And then later today, I'll talk, I'll tell you, well, hopefully today I'll, I'll tell you uh, what is known rigorously? What what do we know to, uh, to prove in certain situations? But sort of uh, that sort of at least uh, formalize our um, expectations. Uh, sort of to know the kind of features we want to reproduce or um, to try to understand what, what makes these states special. So suppose we have this is our say a two D lattice or something. I have some region A here, I have some other region B here. Then I could look at a correlation function. Um, uh, for example, expectation value of OA, OB, and then I subtract um, the disconnected part. So product of the expectation value of OA times the one of OB, but then we would expect that this, well, I guess that scales with the size of the operator itself, but that I'll ignore. You would uh, say that in a gap theory, um, 
this decays exponentially, right? So there's somehow this uh, distance between A and B, which would, would be uh, this one in some sense, uh, divided by some kind of correlation length, right? And the correlation length will depend on this gap. Okay, so that's maybe what we would expect in a gap theory. Um, and then maybe in a, in a critical theory, on a gapless theory, maybe we might expect at least some kind of decay. Uh, let's say algebraic. So maybe I'll just write P, there's some power P without committing to anything. Let's say in a CFT, right, or some like critical uh, right, of fermions on a line or something, you, that's the kind of things you would expect. Okay. So that's one way in which um, maybe, uh, well, states that we often care about are special. It's in the decay of correlations. Another aspect in which they are special is in, the, in, the, in their entanglement properties. And that's maybe a, um, a well, by now quite old, but still it's more recent, I think, perspective. Okay. Great. Um, now, uh, I guess Patrick discussed way, well, he discussed entanglement, pure state entanglement, and he probably discussed the ways of quantifying entanglement. And maybe uh, someone remembers and it's courageous enough to shout out what would be such a measure. I'm not sure if we're asking. We, we've talked about questions. Renyi entropies and entanglement entropies. And great, great, it. okay, super. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's, let's start with entanglement entropies and I'll remind you of the Renyi ones in a moment. Um, so one way of, do, of, 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 of measuring, quantifying pure state entanglement, right, is I have a system, I guess I should draw the picture first. Um, I have some uh, subset A, then the rest is uh, A complement, right? And then I could ask, what is the phenomenal entropy of the reduced density matrix rho sub a, and I guess we usually write this as s of a or s of rho sub a, and it's defined as minus trace rho a log rho times log rho a. That's uh, thanks, Jonathan. That's something that Patrick uh, will have introduced. So that's the phenomenal entropy of subsystem a, or the entanglement entropy between a and a complement. Okay, and that's a meaningful thing for pure states. Now. I'm not sure if Patrick did discuss this. Um, we'll probably in any case come back to that on, uh, on Thursday, um, but maybe someone knows, like what, what is your expectation if you take a generic state uh, in this uh, big vast Hilbert space here and you ask, uh, you know, what, 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 is, what is the entropy of a subsystem A going to look like generically? Say A is less than half of the system. What would you expect the entropy to, 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 to be if you just pick a random state from the Hilbert space, not a ground state? Right, so the, the largest value that the entropy can take is the logarithm of the Hilbert space dimension. And you would expect that it's basically saturated, maybe up to some order one corrections if A has the size of A is the same as the size of A complement. Um, but if, uh, the, if A is a, you know, some constant size chunk inside a large many body system, well, sorry, in, like inside a very large Hilbert space, you would basically expect that it's, it's going to be saturated. So for a, for a generic state, not for say a ground state of some Hamiltonian, um, we would think that that's, log of the Hilbert space dimension, but which Hilbert space, the Hilbert space in which the density operator rho a lives on, right? And that's going to be d uh, to the power number of, uh, you know, sites in, in this region a, so d to the size of a, okay? And that's of course the same as the size of a times, well, I guess a constant, which is in this case, this dimension. Uh, so that's called a volume law, right? Because the entanglement is grows proportionally to the volume. And I should uh, write immediately that, Oh, this is the expectation um, for a generic state. So if you picked it randomly, uniformly at random. So for example, maybe when, uh, so when uh, Don Page computed the page curve, right? That's the kind of stuff uh, he, he, for example, would have computed in, in sort of to, to get an intuition. Okay. So that's called a volume law. Now it turns out that actually in, in, in many situations, uh, this, we do not have this volume scaling, okay? Um, so in, for example, in a gapped system, um, in one dimensions we can prove and in higher dimensions we can prove in some cases and we believe that in most systems of interest, the entanglement actually does not grow like the volume of a region, but only proportional to the size of the boundary of that region. So what does the boundary mean? Well, suppose we have a ladder system like, like in the picture here, right? So there's a, basically, well, there's sites inside this region, there's outside this region, right? And then there's these edges, these bonds that go across. And so, so the 
uh, edges and the letters, right? And could imagine, right? Maybe maybe these are sort of nearest neighbor sites. So I'm connecting here, right? So it's the number of these uh, uh, things that go across here, the number of these edges that go across here, but that's the boundary of a region. That's the same, of course, as the boundary of the of the complement of A. So if if I assume say everything's on a on a on a, on a torus or something, right? So imagine there's no boundary here. Um, then um, right. So so then actually the expectation um, in it's a, a gapped phase if I, if I gapped local Hamiltonian, so I have local Hamiltonian that's an energy gap in the limit of large system sizes. We'd rather think there should be a constant times the surface area of the boundary of the region of this region, right? Okay, and that's called an area law. So let's say a gapped system. You believe this, okay? And so, for example, well, I guess we'll discuss this later. But say in one dimension, there's a uh, famous result by Hastings, uh, who, who proved basically this. Okay. Now, uh, how about gapless systems? Right. Then sometimes the area law can be violated. For example, we know. Um, well, maybe before saying that, maybe just to point out, I drew two-dimensional pictures here. If I would have drawn a one-dimensional picture. Then, uh, well, uh, and say an interval, maybe I should actually draw this instead of talking about drawing it. So say we have a one dimensional system, right? Say it's these are lattice sides here. Um, and I look at a subsystem that's say, this is region A. Well, what's the boundary? The boundary is only two points here, right? So the boundary does not scale at all with the size of A. It's just the boundary of the region A, right? It's like this bit plus this bit, it's two, okay? So in a one-dimensional uh, uh, gapped uh, local, uh, well, in a one or two quantum system, but they gapped local Hamiltonian, uh, we would expect that actually the entropy maybe uh, does not decrease at some point, right? It stops decreasing and then it's just independent of the size of the subsystem, okay? Now in say uh, a critical system, that's not the case, right? There we believe that the, this area law is violated. Well, we know this area law is violated logarithmically. So the entropy there would scale like the logarithm of the size of this interval which is the system size here. So it's not proportional to A, but to log A. And similarly in higher dimensions, say if you have a system of even free fermions, but with a Fermi surface, uh, then there would again be a logarithmic violation of this area law. Um, so in, in various situations, um, uh, we, uh, the, area, the area law can be violated, but it's going to be slightly so typically. Okay. I mean, so in the setting of ground states. May I ask a question? Sure. Is there a physical intuition of why that system should have an area law versus a volume law for gap systems? Like a um, physical intuition? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think yeah, I, I think that, that's, that's a great question. I think just there's probably many ways of try, of, of, of finding, um, well, several interests one could give. I mean, if one believes, for example, uh, this exponential decay of correlations, then one might think that only sort of neighboring sites are relevant, right? So if one sort of equates correlations and entanglement, then one would somehow believe that maybe because, you know, um, correlation space only exists up to a length scale chi. Similarly, the, the entanglement should only be relevant up to a length scale chi. So one would sort of think that most of the entanglement at the stage should basically come between sort of, uh, you know, entanglement on a length scale uh, uh, chi. Right, so stuff sort of deep inside A will not be entangled with stuff uh, way outside A. Um, and so that's one idea. And that's actually the, maybe one motive. Yeah, so this idea that sort of the entanglement is really sort of in some sense very local. And hence for the entanglement between A and A complement only sort of these boundary bits are relevant. That's basically what's going to directly lead to this idea of a, of a tensor network state that, that I'll define in a moment. But that's maybe one piece of uh, motivation. Great, thanks. Uh, I also have a question. Yes. Uh, so when you say generic state, is, can I sort of think of it as like a highly excited state far away from the ground state? Um, I, I think that would probably also be true. I mean, when I said generic, I, I really meant uh, chosen at random from Hilbert space. So not the eigenstate of you know, fixed Hamiltonian. So right, it's really just you have this 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 big Hilbert space. You pick a vector at random, like it's like a big sphere, right? Big high dimensional sphere. Um, but I think that would also be the expectation for sort of a high energy state. What do you say? Okay, by like non-low energy state. Great, thanks. Um, right. So maybe I'll just heuristically write the entropy. Maybe 
there would scale as say size of boundary times, and then say it's some logarithmic term. And then of course, if I take the logarithm, it doesn't matter whether I take the size of a or the size of the boundary a, right? That will be just logarithm of some linear size in the end. Um, okay, so in a one DCT, right, this is constant. So we have this logarithmic divergence, um, but that would maybe also be the, the form one would expect in high dimensions. Okay. Um, now we discussed the phenomenon entropy. Jonathan already mentioned Rennie entropies before. Rennie entropies are a generalization of the phenomenon entropy and they're technically useful. Uh, they can be both stronger and weaker depending on the Rennie parameter. Um, so what I wanna do is I wanna introduce them or remind them uh, real quick because they, they will hopefully come back later today. Um, and the reason I wanna do it is basically just to assert at this point that these area laws in situations we know them to be true, they actually hold in a stronger sense also for Rennie entropies. And that's going to be useful if we are interested in later. Some of the, this will give us a stronger guarantee to approximate states by you know these uh, well that's the network states that we haven't really defined yet. Okay, so um, I'll just give you the definition. So Rennie entropy is a again an entropic quantity like phenomenal entropy, but now it depends on a parameter that I'll call alpha. Uh, so the alpha of the Rennie entropy is by definition one over one minus alpha times logarithm of trace rho to the alpha. Okay, alpha is going to be just some number that's uh, say larger equal, large equals to zero. Um, in the, well, I, I guess naively this thing is well-defined for alpha strictly larger than zero and alpha not equals to one, right? Uh, because for alpha equals one, so maybe I'll, I'll start there, okay. Um, Patrick probably mentioned that in the limit where alpha goes to one, uh, the Rennie, ent Rennie entropy converges to the phenomenon entropy. So we'll just by continuity extend the definition. We'll also allow alpha equals, one, alpha equals to one. And this it's an exercise to verify that this is the same as the phenomenon entropy, which I guess is, I, I call S above. Oh, so S for Neumann, okay. Um, what are other examples of Rennie entropy? Well, another example would be Rennie two entropy, which is sort of the, sort of the first non-trivial one. And because alpha is an integer there, that's a particularly nice one. So the Rennie two entropy, right, is in the it's minus logarithm trace rho squared. Okay. Um, now, what happens as we take alpha all the way to infinity, then basically what's going to happen is that this trace is going to be dominated by the largest eigenvalue of, of rho, of the density operator rho. All right, it's going to be roughly, I mean, this, 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 this thing, right, will be, um, well, it's going to be roughly something like, uh, uh, lambda uh, well, alpha times lambda max, right? And then we are dividing again by one over one minus alpha. So the alpha divided by minus alpha for alpha really large uh, is going to go to minus one. So the S, S infinity um, in the limit will get minus log of the largest eigenvalue of this density operator row. Okay, so this uh, I'm just asserting that's the limiting behavior. So we take alpha all the way to infinity. Uh, does anyone have an idea what happens? Or maybe Patrick explained what happens when alpha goes to zero. Maybe you, you recognize this just from the formula, from the definition that I gave. Does anyone have an idea? It's zero, it's zero. The log Keep of the rank, right? Or... I, I, I think both answers were correct as far as I could hear them. Um, the log of the rank of the density matrix, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's what, what you said, exactly. That's, that's exactly right. Thanks. So we have these numbers and um, it's easy to see that, well, not only are these arranged uh, monotonically decreasing, but in general, the Rennie, Rennie entropy is monotonically decreasing in this parameter alpha. But we'll mostly care about these values, I, I think, um, well, certainly today. Okay. And this first one, um, it's, well, because it's the largest also called the max entropy of a quantum state. Okay, so we'll write S max of rho. Okay, so it's this log rank. Right, the log rank is really just the effective Hilbert space dimension on which this density operator lives. It's like extremely coarse. And then, you know, the more we tune up this parameter, right, then it's going to capture more information. But you should, roughly speaking, you should think of, of the Rennie entropies where alpha is less than one as being, well, closer to the rank, right? It captures more about the support of the whole state. And for alpha smaller than one, right, it's, well, it's even smaller than the phenomenon entropy. So in particular, one can show that for all these entropies from two to infinity, they at most differ by a factor of two. So they're kind of all the same, okay? And I think there's similar statements for this range less than, than, less than one half, say. Okay. I mean, or they, they are similarly technically useful. Okay, so these, this is sort of a whole zoo of, of measures. 
um, they all have the property. Whoop, sorry, I screwed up. I think this is S1, not S alpha. So S, S0, S1, S2, S infinity. Okay, the rest is in between. All right. Now, they all have the property, just like phenomena entropy, that they are equal to zero if the state is pure. Okay, that's clear because pure state has rank one on the one hand side, right? And large angle is also one. So they're zero if pure, all of them. And they're equal to um, log of the dimension on which is, in which is dense symmetric lives. Maybe I'll write log D or, or maybe log capital D um, if rho is uniform, uniform state. So identity divided by the dimension. Okay. But in general, if this if the if the set of the eigenvalues of rho are different, that we say when the entanglement spectrum is non-trivial, they are they will be different. They will be all different. Okay. Now, why are those interesting? Um, uh, well, for one, they are technically useful, um, as maybe we'll see uh, later. Um, so, for example, if we have an area law, not just for the phenomenon entropy, right, which is uh, uh, this guy here. But say a Fourier Renyi entropy, say the one half Renyi entropy, or well, even the zero Renyi entropy, that would be a much stronger requirement. Uh, a, a, sorry, a much stronger result, a much stronger result that we could use as an input for, say, if we wanted to prove some some other result. Okay, so uh, it gives us stronger bounds or stronger guarantees uh, if alpha is say less than one. Um, uh, but also somehow the phenomenon entropy is a bit of an annoying function, right? Because uh, because of this logarithm here. Whereas uh, this Renyi entropy, well, essentially it boils down to a computing trace of rho to the alpha. So if alpha is an integer, that's a very you know, tame thing to study about. I guess it's, it would be tame for alpha equals one, except if we didn't divide by zero here. Um, but say for alpha an integer uh, uh, larger or equals to two, uh, those are really nice, uh, uh, nice to handle. So they can also just be easier to handle and, and we'll hopefully see lots of that on Friday. because we can employ the replica trick. Okay. And now sort of the reason why I talked about Renyi entropies at this point is just uh, basically, well, to introduce them and to, re to re re recap them, but also to say that basically all we wrote above here is also expected to hold for Renyi entropies with, with alpha uh, strictly less than one, but of course not alpha equals zero. Somehow the rank is two cores, right? Generally we believe that the rank, you know, it's probably as large as can be subject to symmetries, but say Renyi one half entropy should also satisfy an area law. So the above discussion of entanglement entropy um, also applies to um, Rennie entropies. And of course, that's clear for alpha larger than one because those numbers are even smaller than the phenomenon entropy. The non-trivial parts say that also for alpha less than one. They will hold. And generically, somehow the, this area law, somehow the constants in front, they will blow up as alpha goes to zero. So for any fixed alpha, we would believe such an area law to hold. And sometimes we know how to prove it. Okay, so that's sort of the, well, we did a bit of phenomenology um, on a very heuristic level of the kind of things that we expect. And now the question is sort of, uh, well, uh, what's the point? Well, the point is that somehow uh, these many body states uh, and many of them, uh, many states we care about, um, they're not at all like generic states. So hopefully we don't need a generic number of parameters to describe them. Hopefully there's a different way of packaging up, packaging up this quantum state. So what we're looking for is some kind of faithful description um, of many body states that is more succinct, but still applies for this class of states. Okay. So you want some kind of faithful description of, uh, of quantum states. Well, of interest, of course. I mean, some of the space is as large as it is, right? We can't hope for a more a nicer description for all states. Um, so we want one that is succinct. That means, right, it has less than n, d to the n parameters, hopefully some polynomial number of parameters in the, in the size of the system. Um, uh, we sort of would like this description somehow to be sort of well, conceptually interesting or, or meaningful in some sense. So kind of, I, I guess that's the kind of thing that one sees, but you know, when one looks at it, then one has some sort of uh, subjective uh, uh, feeling about whether something is meaningful or not in, in that case. Um, but for example, it could be a, an answer that is, sort of reflects the locality of the system that you're, you're trying to describe. Right. So, uh, and maybe the last thing that would be really good is if it was a computationally useful answer. 
or description, right? So that we could actually, uh, well, there would be maybe a calculus for doing sort of, you know, theoreticians calculations and maybe even people who run computer codes, they could, you know, use this ansatz to efficiently compute with it. So maybe I'll summarize this as computationally, uh, well, useful, I guess, for lack of a better word. So that's, uh, that's kind of what we would like. And uh, say in the simplest possible situation, which is sort of the say one dimensional um, local Hamiltonians, right? That's going to be achieved by circular tensor networks. And in general, you know, some, some, sometimes you have to give things up. Uh, maybe things invariably become computationally hard uh, to, you know, to, to compute with in higher dimensions. That's something that's maybe not unavoidable because some, some physics problems are, just happen to be hard, computationally hard. But somehow um, there will still be sort of, you know, uh, benefits from this formalism, it will be still a succinct formalism and one from which we can extract physics sort of by looking at it by drawing pictures. Okay. Um, so I, I guess that being said, uh, I'm probably almost at the point where I want to introduce these things and I'll, I'll, I'll start drawing pictures. Uh, but maybe someone who has already an idea how well how how one could describe a quantum state um, rather well in a, in, a, in a sort of a smarter way than by um, you know giving a big exponentially large list of coefficients. Um, right, so here's a here's you know um, uh, well so the devil's advocate kind of a, a, a suggestion. Why don't we just write down a local Hamiltonian? Right, that's a perfectly succinct and meaningful description uh, that parameterizes you know a really large uh, quantum state. Okay, and the reason, of course, is kind of well, it's kind of a tautological thing, right? So I mean, it's of course great, but but if you give me a Hamiltonian, but somehow I would like to extract information from it, I want to compute correlation function, a ground state for example, and that's not obvious how to get right. So maybe that's a less computationally useful description that you could give. Another description you could try is, well, you know, maybe we, I just look at, um, say, uh, you know, product states or something. You know, I just sort of throw away all the entanglement just to get sort of a first idea. That basically leads you to mean field theory. But, you know, that works for certain problems, but not for others. So it's sort of not faithful enough. So in some sense, you could say, you know, one motivation of what's going to come is you want to go from sort of mean field theory or sort of mean field states, product states, uncorrelated states, uh, sort of introducing more and more potential for correlation or for entanglement. And that's really the idea behind these tensor networks. So the way we'll, sort of the meta idea by which we want to address this is the following. Uh, we want to build up um, a many body state um, by contracting lots of little tensors. We have like uh, like little tensors, but right? so so why are ten why why is well we had tensors already here, right? This was a tensor, but this was a bad tensor because it had a, it had a large number of legs. And that hence we need an, an exponential, well, a, a number that's exponential. In number, well, the dimension of right so such a space of tensors is the exponential in the number of legs, right? But if, we, if you have lots of small tensors, say they have all only three or four legs, some constant number of legs, we contract those, right? That's much more succinct. That's much more efficient. So the idea would be to build up a big quantum state uh, by gluing together or by contracting um, lots of small tensors. Now th that's something that's best done by in pictures. So here's well, so and and I guess the the sort of uh, uh, calculus that I'm going to use is probably familiar to many of you, but I just still want to write it down once in a very precise way. So when I'm going to talk about tensors, right, uh, the way I'm going to draw them is maybe I'll sometimes I'm label them, maybe they say tensor T, right, and I'm just going to add a bunch of legs, and each leg corresponds to one index of the tensor. Right? And so maybe if this is sort of the system A, system B, and system C over here. Right, um, or maybe I'll use lowercase letters to denote sort of the values that these indices will attain or something, let's like say A, B, and C. Right, then this thing, uh, this picture corresponds to a quantum state. Well, that's sum over, say, A, B, C. And here are these components of the tensor, cat A, B, C. Maybe I should put a cat around here as well. Right, so the, picture, the pictures I'm going to draw are, are as follows, right? So, so an n like tensor corresponds to a quantum state and some n fold tensor product. In this case, right, it was be something like first to its space, second to its space, third to its space. Um, and now, um, if I have two of those tensors, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, glue two of the legs together, two of the dangling legs together. And what that's supposed to mean is that I want to do a contraction, a tensor contraction, right? So I'm taking the product of both and I'm contracting over this common index. So in pictures, um, Suppose we have one of these, say this tensor T and another tensor S, right? And I uh, 
well, I guess, suppose I start like so, right? This would be now something that has six legs, one, two, three, four, five, six. But now I'm going to um, glue them together, glue sort of these two legs together. This is going to now correspond to a contraction. So this thing is going to define a tensor U. Um, this tensor now is a four index tensor, right? Does A, B, C, D, E. Well, A, B, C, D are the indices, U, A, B, C, D, cat A, B, C, D. Um, where U, A, B, C, D is, you know, T, A, B, some index E times S, um, say C, D, E. And somehow we, among friends, we remember the index convention, remember which index corresponds to which leg. And now I have to sum up all choices for this index E, right? A, B, E. Yes, and I'm summing because this uh, uh, lag is not, it's not dangling anymore. It has two endpoints and hence I do a contraction. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yes, yes, yes. Um, so I, I think I'm just missing some of the big picture here. Uh, yep. So we wanted to take like a generic state in the Hilbert space, right? And hmm. represent it in some nice way. Are we like throwing out any information by taking the only the states that can be represented as these tensor networks or uh, of like no, so, little tensors that can be contracted together? Or yeah, yeah, it, no, it, no, no, can that represent any state? Right, a great question. So somehow, um, so maybe just to say that, so the motivation of, uh, so where I'm coming from is basically the observation that while there's lots of space, the states in Hilbert space, we often only care about special states, for example, ground states, low energy states and so on. And those are very special. And we wanna find a, a sort of a, an, uh, an approach or a way of parameterizing those states in particular in a way that's more economic, but also more insightful than just by listing the, by giving the coefficients of the whole wave function. Mm -hmm. um, and so now I'm basically uh, describing, uh, I'm about to describe such an approach. Uh, and this approach will have parameters, right? For example, it will have the question, you know, um, what is the dimension of this Hilbert space I'm contracting over and so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, depending on how I pick those parameters, either I will be able to describe any state, but I won't save anything, or I will only be able to describe special states and I'll save in this way. And I'll maybe I'll, I'll learn something about the states in this way, but then I have to sort of pick sort of the, the, this network in a very careful way in such a way that reflects the physics of the problem. Okay. Um, but what I'm doing right now, um, so this is what kind of what I want to do in a moment, but right now I just want to, play around a little bit and define, you know, what is a tensor network in general, sort of isolated from physics. And we'll come back in a moment to things like area laws, correlation functions, and so on. Um, yeah, Th okay. does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Great. Sure. Great. OK, so I guess somehow all I was saying here is um, I'm going to draw tensors as little blobs, little vertices with dangling edges. If I take a bunch of those, I, I glue edges together. That corresponds to a tensor contraction. And I can think of tensors as well as things as many indices, so I can think of them as quantum states in the usual way. So maybe I shouldn't have even written these, these lines here, right? This is some TABC. That's some tensor, some four index tensor, right? Those four dangling, dangling legs, dangling edges, um, which is defined by contracting this three index tensor with that three index tensor uh, along this common index. Okay. So one more thing that we'll often do is of, that we'll also, so that's a bit boring, but I just want to say it. Well, just draw lines, okay? And these lines, they will just correspond. Well, they have two edges, right? So they somehow they correspond to a linear map. They will just correspond to the identity, okay? So left index equals right index. So you could write this as a quantum state, like, uh, you know, sum of a cat AA, which is short for cat A tensor cat A. Or you could say, well, the indices are some chronic delta, delta AB. And so depending on your preference, if you think of it as a quantum state, you might write it like, like so. Okay. So what is the picture here well in general i have some you know picture with vertices edges some edges are dangling or some legs are dangling other edges are well they're really edges with two vertices that are uh, incident to two vertices um this kind of graphical formula is called a tensor network okay and uh you know there's many questions there's a question what will i choose these tensors to be, right? Uh, how do I pick sort of uh, the kind of network? I mean, right now I showed you a network with one vertex, two vertices. Uh, if you want to describe a many body state, there's probably going to be lots of vertices. Uh, how do I arrange them? How do I connect them up and so on and so forth? And that's not obvious. It's also not obvious that that's a good way of thinking about physics. Um, and so I, I want to sort of motivate this by talking about one dimensional systems in a moment. But before I just want to practice and play a little bit around with uh, 
uh, just with this formalism, with the graphical calculus to it so that they can get some experience building up quantum states from, from tensors. Okay. So, okay, so on the left hand side, we have a tensor network. And then on the right hand side, I guess here, I was uh, uh, giving you formulas for the corresponding tensor network states or tensors. Um, that are defined by the left hand side picture if we commit to a choice of tensor here and here. Okay. And I guess the distinction is largely academic and I'll probably not be consistent. Okay, okay here we learn sort of what, how to represent contraction graphically. Okay, so here's, here's some examples. Okay, we can do those together. Suppose I start with a single tensor with a single three leg tensor. And that's the, going to be the tensor that corresponds to the quantum state zero, 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 plus one, one, one. Okay, so I, I don't normalize it just for our own sanity. Um, that's called a GT state sometimes, or a Schrodinger kitten state, because it only has right, three constituents. It's not, not quite the cat. Um, now, the question is, suppose you take such a three leg tensor and uh, you take lots of them and you glue them together, okay? so. My question is, what is the quantum, the quantum state that's being described uh, by this picture here? Okay, and maybe, right? So these are all three like tensors. I want to take them all the same. These are all the same as above. So uh, right here, I chose two different ones here. I want to pick all. These should all be that, that very state over here. And maybe I'll just bend this leg downwards, right? Uh, so that all the dangling legs, they sort of sit on a lattice of some size, right? So that's a quantum state. So what is this thing, right? That's a quantum state of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight qubits. Because here, every degree of freedom was two dimensional, I, I guess, uh, implicitly, because I had a zero and a one state. Maybe I can make this explicit while you think about what the state is. So my question is, I mean, so we discussed this would be a quantum state of, I guess, yeah, again, of eight qubits. There's eight dangling legs. Uh, which state is it? is my question for you. Right, this picture should somehow correspond to a, to a quantum state. Does anyone have a thought or maybe a question about the, I mean, if you have a question what these pictures mean and, and that, that's please to ask because more, probably more pictures and less formulas as we move on. If you have an idea what the, what the quantum state is corresponding to the picture, please, please do say. Right. So maybe, I'm not sure if it helps, right? But maybe I could also sort of write this in different ways. So let's give this tensor a name, let's call it T. And again, we put T everywhere, same tensor, right? But this tensor has the property that all its coefficients are zero, right? Except when A equals B equals C. But that's just another way of writing down this tensor. Right. A you see can be either zero or one. Okay. Right. So if you think about it, right? So again, we know that say if let's say focus on the first tensor, right? Say I see on oh, test these three legs. And we know that the corresponding index is either zero or one, right? Otherwise this thing does not contribute. Okay. So for example, um, yeah, it's, otherwise this thing does not contribute contribute. Suppose you're sort of in, in this, in this uh, well, yeah, sort of in, in, in this part, well, let's say. Well, suppose we're in the case where we're where sort of this guy zero and zero and zero, but then now we can look at the next tensor when, well, because this index is zero, we know that we only get a non-zero contribution if this guy and that guy, those legs are also already in state zero. Right? So somehow as soon as, um, well, say those two are zero, the rest also will have to be zeros, right? It sort of propagates along. Similarly, uh, there's, there's another option, right? If we sort of um, started with one, 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 right? Then this one forces, well, those legs also to be one, those legs also to be one and so on and so forth. And so this picture corresponds, uh, um, I guess, to this state with zero, well, with eight zeros. It looks interesting if I abbreviate the things with dots, right? So basically what we built, we built a large GZ state, a Schrodinger cat state from you know, lots of small Schrodinger kitten states in this graphical calculus. Um, right, if you think about, I guess another way of thinking about it is really sort of, you know, you have this tensor and you replace it by either cat zero, 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 you know, right? it's like a sum of, you know, the what you would get if you plugged in this particular state plus the option when you you know plugged in that particular state here and that's basically exactly the reasoning i presented before are, are there any questions about what i'm like when i'm play around with this uh uh 
so the, the jargon I'm using or the pictures I'm drawing. Maybe we'll- I think that um, it's, it's a little non-intuitive for me looking at this because originally the legs were indexed A, B, C. And so when I look at that compared to the right-hand side of your first equation, it, it seems like each of those like zero, zero, zero would correspond to the ABC. And then when I look at the, the next picture with six um, tensors, I would expect each of those to be ABC, um, not to have eight indices within the, 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 um, the cat. I guess that that's what's a little confusing for me to see. Um, let me see if I understand. Um, uh, you, you mean sort of the fact that, that I sort of call this, this index say A, and so you would, you would expect some of this A has to be the same as that A. That's correct. Rather I would expect being, each of those tensors index, in the or, or those yeah, to have their own ABC. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So I, so that's yeah, that's really somehow. I, I guess maybe I, I maybe that I guess that's a phenomenon that already in some sense appears here, right? Um, somehow, you know, if if we assume those were the same tensors, right? Uh, really, what we're doing here is right. We're taking that tensor product. So now we have you know indices on the left, indices on the right. They're completely just independent indices, and then we do a contraction, right? It's really a just two-step process. So here's another way of thinking about it. You start with this, you know, just a bunch of tensors, and you know, you just think of it as a tensor product, right? So that's really indices A, B, C, D, E, F, uh, I don't know, G, H, I, and so on and so forth, right? So, th so that's now a, a thing that has, I don't know, say one, two, three, four, five, six times three many indices. And now I'm going to start contracting, right? Now I'm going to start contracting here. So I will set C equals D, and I'm going to sum over C, right? That's really what that's what contraction means, right? So we're summing over C, I'm setting those to be the same, uh, summing over F, setting those to be the same, summing over I, and so on, right? And so what remains uh, are the indices here. Maybe that's an, another way of thinking about it. Yeah, that um, was helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, maybe we do one more example. Um, maybe uh, a, a funny one that doesn't have any dangling legs. So suppose um, we have three tensors. Here's one. Um, I'll, I'll connect them in a moment. Here's another one. Here's your third one. So as, I, as I've written it now, right, I, I wrote three objects that are two tensors. Right, the two tensors are matrix. Okay. Now what happens if I contract these? Right. Actually, maybe let's let's not write C at this point. Maybe let's just write it like so. So we have a matrix here. Oops, sorry. We have a matrix here. So two tensors here. Another two tensor here. So we have two matrices, AIJ and BKL. Uh, now I'm going to contract here. So I'm, I'm going to glue those legs together. Okay. So what remains is a two index object, right? These are the two indices. Um, what does this correspond to? What's this two index object? The matrix multiplication. It's exactly the matrix multiplication, exactly, right? Sort of if 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 you look at the IAK component, right? It's um, yeah, sort of yeah, if you look at sort of the IAK component. Um, of this, uh, well, I guess we haven't given it a name, but sort of, yeah. yeah so the IIK component, I'll, I'll sort of give you a graphical way of denoting this in a moment, right? That's exactly A, I, J, B, J, K, sum over J, right? And this, I'm thinking of J, this is my I, this is my K. Right, but so of these labels I'm using are the I, J, and K, they're completely artificial, right? So this picture makes sense without giving names to, the, to these edges here. It's just a, uh, yeah. So now I guess we can, can we can continue and ask, suppose we have another two index tensor here and we do this contraction, that contraction over here. So now we have an object that has only contractions and no dangling edges anymore. So that corresponds to a scalar, right? It's yes. just a number. Does anyone ever thought what it this number would place. be? Trace the matrix product. Trace. Exactly, that's exactly right, yeah, that's right. Because what do we do? Well, we sum over all these uh, edges, so the indices correspond to the edges where you do a contraction, right? And then AIJ, EJK, CKI, um, which is exactly this, this trace of a matrix product. Okay, so the takeaway message is closed tensor networks without any dangling edges, uh, dangling legs, they correspond to scalars. Um, if there's dangling legs, then you can really think of them as a non-trivial tensor. And we usually think of them as states, but you can also think of them as operators, right? So for example, you can think of a, this matrix here, this two index tensor, you can think of a quantum state of two systems, or you can think of as a linear map from one side to the other, and they'll be completely non-committal to, as to the interpretation uh, in general, but we will, of course, mostly be interested in building quantum states. Okay. 
Can I ask a question? Of course. So the uh, the tensors say tensor A here. Is there mm -hmm. a graphical way to represent, say, symmetries of the indices? Because if the two legs, if it's not symmetric, then the way that it's contracted may, you know, it could be a transpose in the trace. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, so here I, I sort of try to um, uh, to indicate which is the I and which is the J index, but that's, I agree, that's sort of not a very formal thing to do. Um, in, in general, somehow the people pick a convention. Usually we look at very regular structures and then maybe we order them like, you know, first comes the a left index and the bottom one and the right index, for example. But but I think there's no, I mean, I think maybe, well, there's, maybe there's versions where people have a smarter way of indicating which index belongs to which leg, but I think it's not very common. So, but, but please do ask if, if at any point it's unclear. And I, you're, you're completely right. I mean, this, it wasn't really clear from this picture. I mean, apart from sort of, uh, but I mean, by analogy that this should be the right way of ordering as opposed to a transpose, yeah. Except, thank you. Thanks. Um, here is another one. Suppose we have an arbitrary tensor with lots of indices. This could be, you know, some sort of density, you know, some some like generic tensor, but it could also be a tensor network. And I'm just drawing this box to represent actually, you know, some like there's some fine grained tensor network structure. In it. But I just want to think of it as an, of, uh, as a as a tensor. So suppose this is any tensor. Um, then what is this object? So we I take a and I take a um, complex conjugate, I guess I'm some of too much of a mathematician to write a star, unfortunately, but so that's complex conjugate. And I contract all these indices. Okay, so I, I sort of turn A sort of upside down and then I complex conjugate. Okay, but some of the turning upside down, you should ignore, that's just, just my thing. Um, um, so so this, what, what does this object correspond to? Um, so that's again a scalar, right? There's no dangling legs anymore. So does that have any interpretation? It's like the norm of A. Yep, the element mod square. Exactly, exactly. So that's exactly uh, the L2 norm squared, right? So I suppose I have these little indices, i, j, k, and so on. And right, we're summing over them. And then we're multiplying A with A bar, the a com so corresponding A component with the A bar component. But that's the L2 norm squared. So that's some of the simple thing you could ask a tensor, right? You could take a tensor, um, whether it's you know given as some primitive tensor or whether, you know, a could also be this picture here, right? A could be this picture corresponding to a quantum state. And so you take this picture times its complex conjugate, you glue everything together, you get a closed tensor network with lots of little dots, lots of vertices. That thing corresponds to the norm of that state. And just as an example. Okay, um, so what's the, so, so that's sort of practicing this calculus. Um, maybe I have a little uh, sort of, uh, practice exercise for you. Um, well, maybe we do this one together still because it's gonna be fun. So what we're going to do basically, uh, a re well, the rest of today and also a, a big part of tomorrow is we are going to look at um, tensor networks of this form. So maybe the, the tensors, they don't need to be all the same, but we are going to just arrange them, you know, on a line on a one dimensional line. And so, and we will think of them as well. I, I claim those are good ways of parameterizing one one D quantum states, quantum states on a one dimensional line, uh, with whatever boundary conditions. We can talk about that later. Um, and for example, and, you know, it satisfies all the right things. It satisfies array laws, correlations decay uh, generically, and so on and so forth. So I, I, I'll give those a name in a moment. We'll call those matrix product states. But I'll give you one other example, and it it looks uh, sort of the construction looks very similar for a small detail. But again, it has the flavor that there's some kind of seed tensor. We're just taking the same seed tensor composed together lots of many times. And I, in this case, I'll put some kind of boundary condition in. So I'll, I'll sort of put something into the tensor left on the right. All right. So what is the this seed tensor in this case? Uh, so it's again a three index tensor. And the one, and, and it's the following. So, uh -huh. so now it comes again the question, how do I enumerate these indices? So I'm going to first write on, so that's my first Hilbert space, that's my second, that's my third Hilbert space. Um, so I wanna take the following state, 0, 0, 0, plus uh, 0, 1, 1, plus 1, 0, 1, I think like so. And again, just to maybe make it graphically clear, this index should correspond to the first tensor factor. Um, uh, this one is going to be the last one. Great. Okay, and um, the uh, tensor network state I want, I want to define is the following. 
Uh, I'm going to take lots of those just like before. And now I'm, well, uh, I'm going to put in a quantum state here on the left and I'm going to project on another quantum state here on the right, okay. What I want to do is I want to put in a, a zero state here and maybe I'll define it. I'll sort of draw this in this, in this particular way. So I'll draw something that kind of looks like a bra, although maybe, yeah, I guess it, depending on your perspective, maybe it should be a cat. Let's say this is a bra zero and that's a cat zero, but really these are just vectors, right? Oh, sorry, and the cat one put in over here. Cat one, like this. Okay. So, okay, so, so my notation when I write something like an I in, a, in such a box, that's really the same as just the I's basis state. Okay. Right. So does that make sense? Right. So that's a vector, basis, basis vector that has a, it's a single, single leg tensor. I contract sort of this the zero guy on the left and the one guy on the right. And in the middle, these are all the same tensors I wrote above. So any thoughts as to as to what the what this quantum state is supposed to represent? Assuming this means in this in this line, one will run. Is is that Excuse me. Can, can you so, sorry? In the in the end, uh, this means in the line it should be one. I mean, how, uh, how to read this state? Uh, this I this, state. This, this, this one here. Yeah, yeah. Ah, so so what I mean is, whenever I'm going to write a, a number like zero, one, or you know, some some symbol into this triangle, and there's a single edge, this is going to correspond uh, to just a the, a cat like a, a, a basis state, it's the i basis state. So, so what I mean is really, you know, I have this three index tensor here, I'm going to contract this just with a standard basis vector, you know, cat zero on the left and cat one on the right. Um, I, I'm not sure, does, does that answer your question or maybe yeah. I didn't fully understand. Is that that cat one, um, is that, um, is it one, 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 since we're in, um, we're the, in the product of three Hilbert spaces, is that right? Um, this one over here? Yeah, yeah. Would that be a, um, a cat one 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 when you write uh, it? Just a one? Uh, no, no. So because um, good question. Um, right. Because, so I, I think of this. This is a three index tensor, uh -huh. and each of these Hilbert spaces is a qubit, right? Mm -hmm. So this is uh, three qubits. So in each of these uh, summons, right, the the zero corresponds to the first qubit, second qubit, third qubit, right, and that's the first qubit, second qubit, third qubit. So it's the same color scheme uh, as I used here. I, so I guess that's so. the yeah. So, so it's, it's really just one. a single qubit thing here. It's really cat one, yeah. It's cat one in the Thanks. third qubit. Yeah, okay, thank yeah. you. Ex exactly, exactly, yeah. yeah. And the third qubit, yeah, exactly. It's a, the orange qubit here, right? And, and sort of, that's the pink qubit on the very left. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Does it, mean Any... pro... Does it mean that we're projecting the last qubit on the third qubit of the last um, answer? On the one state and the first one in the zero state, and then in the middle we leave arbitrariness of how to contract the, the different qubits. That's correct, absolutely correct, yes. Exactly. That's right, yeah. So um, the first thing yeah. I can see is that it looks like the reduced density matrix on each qubit will be maximally mixed. Interesting. Um, what's uh, what's your thinking? Well, it's definitely true on the first and last, because um, if you just look at what the state is going to be on the first qubit, uh, when you project in the zero, you end up with you end up projecting out the third term in the tensor, so you end up with an even superposition of a zero and a one state on the the dangling leg. And the same thing's true of the last qubit when you project in the one, and there's a lot of symmetry, so I assume this is going to have to be true all the way through the the chain. Uh, that, that's, an, that's an interesting part comment. So, so maybe, uh, it, 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 I mean, I think, I think that was a great, uh, a great starting point, right? Imagine we start with a zero here, right? And really we are sort of limited to those two summons here, right? That, that's what you were saying as well. So now um, uh, we can either sort of output a zero here if you want, right? And then this, this, this index here will be in the zero state or we output a one here and then that qubit will be in the one state, right? That's really what these, what these two terms mean sort of graphically as like if you think of it as a process okay so so that's sort of the sort of the the universe sort of splits right into two parts sort of so I'll maybe start writing there's sort of the part where we output a zero and we have to think about what happens then and that's the part where we output a one we can ask what happens then okay 
So now what happens in the next step, right? So if this guy is now in is sort of in the first sort of branch of the wave function, right? This guy, well, this will be zero, zero, zero. So this one will be zero. So exactly the same structure happens, like Jonathan was saying, right? That will be the zero, zero part and the zero, one part, right? So let me, I can sort of uh, continue here. And so I can say, okay, the, in this case, second qubit will be either zero or it will be one and things will continue. If it's one, um, but, aren't you stuck with one exactly, all the yeah, way through and you have no more choice? Uh, absolutely, exactly. So if, if it's one, then we actually in this part, right, and, and we, we stay one on this hidden register here on this on this intermediate edge, right? And so we're actually stuck at one. Uh, well, we sort of well, we, we are stuck at one on this on this uh, sort of hidden bond, and we are always output zero on on the on the on on the degree of freedom that we see, right? Right? Because if this guy's one, then th that's the only term that applies. We have one zero one, one zero one, and so on and so forth. So, so this is going to be some like, single thing. Yeah, this no, is going to be right. some like even superposition of states where there's a one in, uh, right? It's it's like a chain of ones, and you can only choose where you start the chain, right? You either start the chain at the first index or the second or the third or or nowhere. Uh, almost, almost, almost. If, and that would be true if I would have put a one here, right? But I'm actually ah, outputting okay. zero in that case. So what it does, it counts basically. So it allows you to place exactly a single one. But at any point of the chain, okay. it's some kind of so, like Turing machine or something. Yeah, so yeah, you can really think of this as some kind of automaton, uh, right? That sort of runs left to the right as some sort of memory, right? And that's exactly that's actually one way of thinking about these matrix products of states that, that uh, I guess we'll still write down today. You can think of them as really what happens. You have sort of a, a quantum memory system of some dimension. That's the dimension of those hidden degrees of freedoms here. You start with a certain state, and then you basically apply a machine. You know. You apply it to this memory and it sort of updates the memory and it also spits out a qubit or it spits out you know whatever is the system here so you can really think of it in this process and one i mean we'll hopefully see that, that that's actually legitimate interpretation so why can we not have a zeros everywhere because i, I post select a project on the one here right and the only way to get a one here is I if i have already output a day one right that's the only sort of the only transition from zero to from you know, pink zero to orange one is by outputting a one so in the end indeed the state will look as follows it will be a superposition of all the different ways of putting a one onto this chain. And okay, I guess my cat symbols are hard to distinguish from the ones, so I'll make them indicate them here. So sometimes this is called a W state. Um, it's like one particular state that people like. It's a uh, it's entangled in a somewhat interesting way. Uh, but I guess the point is so we can sort of, you know, we can kind of create interesting correlations, right, from very simple tensors. Okay, so somehow maybe that, that gives us hope that we can also uh, sort of produce sort of more interesting states in this way, because those are already kind of fun and we didn't even try. Yeah. Uh, okay, so, uh, okay, maybe just one sort of meta example. So we have been collecting a bunch of examples. Any quantum circuit, if you have seen quantum circuits, any quantum circuit is, of course, also a tensor network, right? The gates are tensors. A quantum gate is a tensor. It's a special one, which is unitary, right? And sort of composing gates is exactly doing tensor contractions. And you start with, say, a state. Say you initialize all your qubits in, in a state zero. And then maybe in the end, you're interested in a certain probability of outcomes, right? That's going to correspond to some kind of contraction or projection. So I'll just maybe briefly say any quantum circuit um, is, is essentially a tensor network. Uh, so probabilities of outcomes of you know measure, local measurements in a quantum circuit. So you typically quantum circuit right, is like you initialize all your qubits on state, you apply some gates, and then you measure say a qubit or many qubits. You can really represent this you know by by um, in a similar way that we compute the norm here. You can do similar games and you can kind of compute probability you know of measurement outcomes as well. Um, so that's somehow good and bad. It means that actually this approach of writing states is really expressive, right? It really, I mean, basically whatever a quantum computer can do, which is, you know, at least as much as a, what a classical computer can do, in some sense, we can encode in this formalism. Of course, that also means on the flip side that probably we will not find, you know, some like super simple way of computing uh, with these states, uh, say on classical computers, because, you know, we can, uh, we can do as much as quantum computers can do, and we believe those are more powerful. In fact, um, while a quantum circuit consists of unitary you know, tensors, unitary circuit elements, unitary gates, tensor networks do not demand unitarity. And that means that they're actually much more powerful 
So be, because we can do what is called post selection, we can project on desired outcomes in the same way that I sort of projected onto zero here. And this way I, sort of, I killed off the all zero state, which would have otherwise been an option to sum. This kind of post selection uh, you know, is, is not something that, well, is, that, that is extremely powerful from a computation complexity point of view. So somehow we have to see, you know, it could be, so probably, you know, if, I, if we look at two dimensional tensor networks, which really is what I, right? So a quantum, maybe just to draw a quantum circuit, right? It's like we have a bunch of you know, gates and we connect them up and, you know, some, uh, some kind of, uh, you know, way, maybe here's another gate, maybe we control this gate on something else. And then in the end, maybe we do some measurement here, right? And the outcomes a bit, and that encodes the answer to some computation problem. And here, maybe we put in some input. Right, that, that looks exactly like the pictures I was drawing, right? It's a bunch of tensors that are being contracted. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's, that's uh, somehow we can at least capture this, but we can also sort of post select and that makes it uh, potentially much more powerful. Um, but tensors here need not be unitary. Okay, so in general, maybe so maybe we'll give sort of a, a really crisp mathematical definition uh, another day tomorrow or the latest, I think on Thursday. But basically, what's a tensor network state, right? So what do we have to pick? We're going to pick some graph, right? So suppose I have my favorite Hilbert space, right? My favorite Hilbert space is maybe um, uh, maybe this many body Hilbert space over here, right? N qubits. Now, what I want, what in order to describe any state in the Hilbert space by tensor network, I'm going to pick a graph that has capital N many dangling legs, right? And they are associated with, the, with, dim, with this dimension D. Now this graph will also have internal legs, right? So for example, uh, the dimension of those indices here does of course not, does not uh, change, well, does not, well, it's, un, it's, un, it's independent from the fact that this is a, is a quantum state on, well, say, let me say it more clearly. Suppose this is, uh, suppose, um, the dimensions, these were little d dimensional. Uh, this is a little d dimensional index, but that's, those two are capital D dimensional indices, right? If I contract, I can contract such a network and I don't somehow see, right? I mean, this defines, uh, well, maybe I put in a state like before, a state on the left and a state on the right, right? This picture here defines a quantum state in three uh, you know, copies of this little d dimensional Hilbert space. It didn't matter that uh, this was a really large Hilbert space in the middle. So that's a choice, right? It's not a choice dictated by physics, but rather by sort of, well, it's something that um, uh, determines the power of this ansatz space. The larger D, the more freedom you have basically in parameterizing states, but also somehow the closer you come in this, you know, you, you we enter sort of the, this generic territory, right? At some point, we'll just have some like weird way of parameterizing a completely general quantum state, which is also not what you want. But sort of what we can do is we can choose what is called uh, these, bond dimensions. So these things are called bond dimensions. I mean, I guess all of them are called bond dimensions, but these ones uh, are some of the ones that are not fixed by physics. Sometimes they're called virtual bond dimensions because they don't, yeah, they don't really correspond to physical degrees of freedom. Um, so we have to pick these bond dimensions. Um, and these bond dimensions, right? Say the capital Ds and the little d here, they dictate the format of this tensor, right? So they dictate that it's a capital D by little d by capital D tensor, but we still have to fix the tensors. So we have to fix a tensor uh, for each vertex. Um, and I guess we have a, such a bond dimension for each edge, of course, of the graph. And we have to pick a tensor for each vertex. And this data together, right, determines a tensor network state, TNS tensor network state. That's basically the, the, the abstract picture. I mean, there was no need that I picked this D to be the same as that D, right? It was just important that this sort of this right index of that tensor has the same dimensionality as the left index of that tensor. So I could have just as well picked this one, D1, D2, D3, and you know, these one maybe by physics, that's a qubit, but that's a Q-thread, who knows, right? So that, there's also no reason that those are the same. But of course, now I have, I'm defining a state in different Hilbert space, D1, tensor D2, tensor D3. We have five minutes left, right? Is that, is that right? Yeah, I was just about to give you a yeah, five minute warning. Yep. Great, Thanks. cool, thanks. So I think, so what we're gonna do is now we're uh, sort of maybe gonna formalize, um, I mean, so this was all like playing around a little bit, but sort of playing around with a purpose, um, namely uh, this structure, the sort of, you know, chain structure, this sort of sequential, you know, sequentially producing quantum states, this has a name, it's called a matrix product state. Um, so I wanna write this down once. And then tomorrow we are going to discuss, you know, what it means, uh, 
you know, why we like them, what they have to do with local physics and one dimension. Um, so maybe, but maybe I think we can still uh, define them and maybe even discuss one interesting property as sort of a uh, prelude. Okay, so these things are called matrix product states. Or MPS. So this is an ansatz for many body state in one dimension. And it's basically exactly what we do here, okay? So the, the answer, so the idea is, right? We have just have a, so we wanna define a quantum uh, state of a chain, say a finite chain, but one can easily adjust this approach to tackle say an infinite system or a system with periodic boundary conditions. I'm going to have a finite chain with open boundary conditions. Uh, so somehow the approach will be a little bit asymmetrical. So here I have a two index tens on the left, and then I have a bunch of three index tensors throughout the bulk of this uh, uh, system. And then on the very right, there's another two index tensor. Okay, and there's some length to this. Just for notational simplicity, I want to pick those to have dimension little d. This, and that's again, that's going to be dictated by physics. If we have some, I don't know, easing model of qubits, right? Then it would be C2s. They would, little d would be two. So maybe we'll call these physical dimensions. Oop. Went downhill. Um, but the other one dimensions, as we just discussed, we can choose arbitrarily. And I'm all going to choose them, I'll choose them to be the same. Okay, so I'll choose those to be dimension capital D throughout, but just so that we can avoid some indices. There's no reason. Um, those are the virtual one dimensions. Often I'll only say one dimension. Now, suppose we have capital N many sites. Um, so yes, let's say we have N sites. Then this defines a state called a matrix product state. In what Hilbert space, well, in CD, to the tensor n, right? And so this is the little d, right? Because those are the non-contracted indices. Okay, and that's so that's completely independent of capital D, as we were saying before. Um, now, the, well, I still have to choose the tensors, and I mean, just to be sure, right? Well, I, I guess it's maybe not even important for today, but of course, as each of these vertices, we are going to choose a tensor. Well, here we are going to choose a two tensor, so basically a matrix from here to here. That's going to be three tensor, three, 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 and again, two, right? I could have also picked those to be a three tensor and then added a state and the left and on the right as kind of two boundary conditions like we did above, but that's not really, doesn't make any difference, okay? So this thing is called a matrix product state. Um, in which sense is that, is it a special state? Of, well, I guess we have one minute left, so we can maybe actually, I'll ask you a more interesting question. So I'm going to ask you, suppose I hand you such a quantum state like here, and I'm, interested in the entropy between the left and the right of this uh, line, right? So this is a many body you know, quantum system, well, many, I guess, uh, an eight body quantum system, but let's imagine that you really had lots of couple and many sites. I want to split the system into two, into the left and, and to the right. So I'm going to say, well, this is uh, system A, that's A complement, okay. How much entanglement is there between A and A complement, okay? So for example, um, yeah, does anyone have any idea? So maybe Patrick mentioned the word Schmidt rank. We discussed these Renyi entropies before. We discussed von Neumann entropies. Um, right, naively, what's a naive bound? So for, we know that you know generic states they have maximum entanglement. Maximum entanglement is log of the Hilbert space dimension. So it's any entropy, whether it's a Renyi entropy, a max entropy, a von Neumann entropy, would be at most little d to the number of sites here, right? I guess d to the four here, or d to the n over two, if I had, you know, uh, n spins on the left, so say n, o, n over two uh, on the left, say n over two sites on the left and n over two on the right, right? So then the naive bound, naive bound is entropy and uh, even max entropy, right? This was the very largest one, so at most d to the n over two. Um, does anyone know a better bound just from staring at this picture? Well, I actually have a question. Uh, yep. Shouldn't it depend on what you choose for, for these tensors? Because 
I could see it. I mean, like just thinking back to what you were saying earlier about the area law versus the volume law, like it seems like depending on what you choose, like the entropy could, could, you know, be fixed at, at the boundary of these two things. If you choose something like the example we had before where you get stuck or something, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So it just seems like it should so, be dependent on the state. Yeah, so it's definitely dependent on the choice of tensors. And I could choose the tensors in such a way, you know, that say you say the entropy is even zero because even though there's these like little uh, pink bonds, I don't right. make like use of them like at all. It's like totally fixed. Um, th that's right, exactly. But on the other hand, uh, if I, if I want to maximize entropy, I do have a constraint merely by the structure of this network, it turns out. And maybe um, well, if Tom allows me to go on for one more minute, um, head. <laughs> Uh, then uh, maybe let's just look actually at a simpler case. Suppose we just had two tensors like so. Let's suppose we had a you know some dimension D here, some dimension D here, and some dimension capital D here. Right, that's going to defi define a quantum state right, of two systems. And we could ask how large can the entropy be? Right? And we and and well again we can say well the entropy is say of, of this of this first side, right? It's say at most at most log D. But actually, so imagine D is really small. That's not the tightest bound you could say, okay? And the reason is that really somehow, so if you're, if you're interested in the rank of the reduced density matrix, right? So the rank of the reduced density matrix is logarithm this is max entropy. So that's, you know, always large equals to E to the entropy. So the rank of this reduced density matrix is the same as the rank of this object. If you sort of think of it as a matrix between left and right. But really what we're doing here is we're, we are factorizing. So, okay, so, so let me say different words. So this thing is a, is a tensor with two indices. We can think of it as a quantum state of two particles, or we can think of it as a matrix. If I compute the rank of this matrix, then that's the same as the rank of the reduced density matrix as, as, as one can so see, and we can maybe talk about this more tomorrow. So the question is, what is the rank of this, of this object if I think of it as a matrix, say from here to here, right? So maybe I, I orient these, these arrows, right? So that's the input space, that's the output space. How large can this rank be? Okay. The key observation is that this picture gives you a factorization of the matrix. It's actually saying that this that sort of the, the matrix from here to there, it's a product of this matrix times that matrix. And this is a matrix, uh, and the first matrix has size, well, capital D by little d, and the second matrix has little d by capital D. Now, the rank of a product of matrices is at most the rank of any constituent, and the rank of a single matrix is, you know, at most the minimum of the number of rows and number of columns. So if this d is smaller than, uh, this, if this capital D is smaller than little d, very confusingly, then actually the rank cannot be log d. So actually the bound that we have here, it, it's, it, we also have a bound that says the entropy of any of these two and actually even the max entropy is at most log of this bond dimension here. So there is a way in which this virtual bond dimension actually has physical significance. It's a bound on the entropy between the left and the right, okay? So now this was a chain of uh, you know, two spins or two particles. Uh, how about the picture we drew above? Well, let's just coarse grain the picture. Let's define a new tensor. So we put everything here into a single box. Everything there we put into a single box. Now, what do we have? Well, that's a single tensor. One index is capital D dimensional. The other index is little d to the n over two. So, you know, if you look at a very large part of this chain, then of course, this will be the thing that bounds, the, that constrains the entropy, okay? So um, what this argument tells us is actually the max entropy and hence any entropy is well, say of, of this half chain, is actually bounded by log of this virtual bond dimension, okay? And the cool thing is, so that's exactly an area law, right? That's exactly an area law in one dimension because um, this thing does not grow as this, as, the, as this region A grows, right? That's like, you have like a super large chain, you split it into two pieces, and the only thing that contributes to this bound was the size of the boundary times log of this, bond, this dimension. So that's, uh, so that's the key basically. So that, that connects basically some of this, this answers to all the discussion at the beginning about area laws and entropy and so on. And yeah, sorry for running over time. So tomorrow we'll continue this, do a little recap and then discuss what are all the cool features of these matrix products things. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks Michael, that was awesome. Um, uh, maybe a few quick questions. Um, so it it's, it's not really a question, but uh, I think there's a small typo in the naive oh. uh, S max. Uh, there's a log. Missing. Oh yeah, yeah, that's logarithm missing. Oh gosh, yeah. Oh, very good, very thanks. Thanks, Vic. Um, yes, 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 yeah. So uh, 
So right, the rank was bounded by d to the n over two and the log rank, which is the max entropy is bounded by logarithm, right? And that's n over two times log d. And this n over two is of course the size of a, right? So the naive bound gives us this volume law and the, well, better bound gives us the area law, right? And areas of one dimensional line segments, they have constant size, right? That's why there's no scaling at all. There's no dependence on a at all for this particular reason. Boundary of a half chain is one side. More quick questions. I guess just out of curiosity, like related to area laws, um, like say you have a state that you know satisfies the area law. I'm curious whether um, subleading corrections, the area law can like tell you anything that characterizes the state further or whether, I guess, if you can get any universal information out of it, I guess, whatever people have done in the literature. And it seems like tensor networks, like can they say anything about that, I guess? Um, yeah, I think I think that's an interesting story to be told. I mean, so for example, I guess one way in which uh, subleading corrects enter say is would be in two-dimensional systems, right, where there's some uh, topological correct say topological order, and um, uh, I guess hopefully tomorrow we'll talk a little bit about a two-dimensional generalization of what we saw here. I guess you already know what it looks like, right? It's going to be a grid, and there's little legs sticking out to the bottom instead of being a line. And there, there's a story that probably you won't have time to talk about, where kind of the uh, you can sort of detect this topological order and think about it actually by 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 by, by sort of uh, understanding what's going on on these virtual bonds. So so they don't only say constrain the entanglement, but sometimes they can actually sort of provide you know it's it's like describing the system on an edge, right, rather than via the bulk. So for example, if the rank drops there, that is related to the topological entanglement entropies, and so on. And so one can sort of have uh, this uh, like a story of sort of virtual symmetries. So symmetries on the virtual level that then implies topological order on the physical level. And so that's a very beautiful story that probably I won't go into much, but but, but I can I can maybe post some literature on Slack. Thanks. Oh, that'd be helpful, yeah. So, so you can yeah, basically I'll, use I'll... virtual symmetries to further- um, To diagnose the topological order, for example. Yeah, that, that's right, yeah, yeah. Cool, thank you. Question or quick question, which is, uh, it seems like at the end you basically said that the entropy is bounded by the minimum of the two of d to the n half and big d, right? So it seems like if you increase the size of this subsystem that you're looking at, you will have some kind of phase transition between volume law and area law. Is that is that right? Uh, yeah, you, you mean in the sense that if you uh, say, yeah, if, if you looked at like a, a really small patch or something, Right, you would sort of maybe expect them to be increases sort of un until the area law kicks in. That, that's, that's, I think, what you're saying. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And also here, it kind of, right, some of there's a bit of a competition between this term and that term. I'd imagine this virtual bond dimension was a constant, but say a thousand, right? But this physical degrees of freedom are qubits, right? Then it, it, may, it might take a while until sort of this bound kicks in, right? That bound will only kick in after some constant, but, but still maybe non trivial system size. Yeah, that's right. So that's, I guess, also related to correlation length and so on. Thanks. Okay, um, let, let, let's uh, leave it there and thank Mike, Michael again. Um, so we'll probably stop the recording now, but I don't know if you're available